Hello and welcome. Welcome to this afternoon's NDARC webinar, the last one of the year. How exciting. Um, so before we begin, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Sarah Farnback. I'm a research fellow here at NDARC. And I'd like to take a moment to really acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land for wherever it is that you're dialing in from today. I'm dialing in today from Nambri and Ngunnawal country. And I'd like to in particular welcome any First Nations people joining us today. So today we're hearing about a fantastic presentation about what are patients' goals with initiating long-acting injectable buprenorphine treatment for opioid use disorder, findings from a qualitative study, a, long, a longitudinal qualitative study. And I'm really delighted today to be able to introduce you to one of our fantastic friends of NDARC, Professor Jo Neal, who's visiting us from King's College in London. London. Um, Joe is also a conjoint professor here at UNSW with the Centre for Social Research, as well as wearing many other hats, including um, on the Board of Addiction as well. So after the presentation, Joe is going to be joined by a fantastic panel with two of our researchers here from NDARC. First up, we've got Dr. Simon Clay, who's a research fellow at NDARC, who is an expert in qualitative methods, of which Joe is going to talk through today. And he's an expert in um, mental health, substance use dependency, STIs, HIV, you name it, Simon does it. We've also got the wonderful Dr. Alison Seckel, who's going to join us today. Uh, Alison is a Barooli based clinician. She's a public health physician, and she works here for NDARC on some of our projects, as well as for the Rural Clinical School in rural New South Wales. So, together, this is going to be a great conversation, I can tell. So we will have time at the end for some questions. So if you think of things as we're going, please pop them in the Q&A function of the Zoom meeting. Um, we won't be using the chat function today, so please use the Q&A function. Um, I might not be able to get through all of them, but I'll do my best to get through as many as I can. Um, so without further ado, I will ask Jo to please turn on her camera and we will get started with the presentation once Joe's online. Hello, Joe. welcome. Hi, everyone. Afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation. Over to you. Excellent. OK, so um, I'm Jo Neal from King's College London, and I'm going to talk to you about patients' goals when initiating long-acting injectable buprenorphine treatment. And if I can share my slides, here we go. Yes, yeah, so um, in thinking about the presentation, it occurred to me that the, um, the first time I spoke at NDARC was about 24 years ago, um, when NDOT was actually based at the corner of Ocker Street and uh, Barker Street. And at Apsod last week, I was telling some of the NDOT researchers this, and they didn't seem to have any memory. And then I realised it was because actually some of them weren't um, born at that point in time. So it's nice to, to come back. And I do hope that in another 24 years, uh, you'll invite me back again. But uh, on to today. So we're talking about uh, long-acting injectable buprenorphine. So I've got some acknowledgements and declarations before we start, if that's okay with everyone. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and collaborators, Steve Parkin and John Strang. I'd especially like to acknowledge uh, Paul Lennon, who is a collaborator on many of our projects, a person with lived experience, who provides expert advice, and James Gunn, who does our transcription for us. And then, of course, obviously, the study participants and the staff at all the services. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is Bouvidal and uh, the co company that developed Bouvidal is Camerus, and Camerus have funded the research. So I do want to acknowledge that and also declare that I have secured uh, industry funding for presentations and research in the last three years. So... I'm going to be talking about a qualitative longitudinal study that we conducted. And just in case anybody was at APSAD last week and thinks I'm going to deliver the same presentation again, I just want to clarify that um, please don't turn off because I am presenting on a different topic, although it's from the same study. And the talk for today is based on this paper, which was published in Substance Abuse Treatment Prevention and Policy earlier in the year, uh, somewhat helpfully um, given the name of the same as the, uh, the presentation, so as not to be too confusing. So a little bit of background information. Um, I would imagine that most people know this already, so I'm probably uh, speaking unnecessarily, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, as most of us know, we've not had much innovation in terms of medication for opioid use disorder uh, for, for a few years now. 
But recently we've had some emerging new uh, types of medications, including long acting injectable buprenorphine, also known as depobuprenorphine. And in fact, there are three products licensed globally, and that's the Indivia product, uh, Supplicade, and then there are two cameras products, Bouvidal Weekly and Bouvidal Monthly. And the clue there is in the name. So the Supplicade is uh, really lasts uh, a month. So somebody has an injection for a month and the treatment lasts for a month. The Bouvidal Weekly is either a week or a month. And the idea behind this is that we're moving away um, with these medications from, for example, methadone or espinor or buprenorphine, where people had daily dosing and had to go to the pharmacy or to the treatment service for the dose. Now people can have these injectable treatments, and uh, that means that they don't have to attend services quite so often. So there is a, an emerging body of research, quantitative and qualitative, and this research is really starting to show that there are pros and cons as you might expect with any medication. So the pros are that the treatment appears to reduce withdrawal symptoms and cravings and seems to be associated with higher treatment adherence, uh, greater abstinence from non-prescribed drugs, and for patients, it can give them greater control over their daily lives because they're not having to ascend services so regularly. That obviously saves them time and energy and, and costs often. But there are negative sides. Um, we think that the evidence suggests that the side effects are probably little different from those from oral buprenorphine, perhaps with some mild um, injection site irritations. But the side effects can be enough to stop some people from continuing with the medication. And of course, with it being a new medication, there are concerns about effectiveness. Some people have concerns about not having the same amount of contact with their providers because they're not actually going in and seeing people every day. And some people have concerns about how they're going to stop the treatment once they're on what is effectively a maintenance treatment. So before I get into my own research, I just want to acknowledge there's been some really great qualitative research done on this topic already um, with some notable contributions from Australia. And some of the names on this slide won't be um, unfamiliar to most of you here, particularly those uh, linked with NDARC, uh, including obviously Simon's work uh, in this field as well. So despite this literature, we thought when we were doing our study that there was a gap in the literature. So our study was more broadly on treatment experiences over the course of a year, but it became apparent to us that there was a gap looking at what people who were receiving this treatment actually wanted themselves from the treatment. So we thought that this would be a nice um, aspect of our data to analyze to see if we could find some answers. So the aim of the paper and of the presentation is basically to address the gap in understanding by exploring what goals patients starting uh, lung actually injectable buprenorphine want to achieve. And looking in particular at whether their goals change over the first six months of treatment and what factors patients think help or hinder them in their ability to attain their goals. Obviously, the research that I'm talking about was conducted in the UK, so we wanted to consider the findings with reference to the UK policy context, and specifically the concepts of recovery and person-centred care. And although I say that, um, I think those two concepts are pretty familiar to everybody here in Australia as well. So let's just talk a minute about those. So the rise of a recovery agenda has been incredibly controversial. Um, so obviously, recovery has its origins in discourses of self-help um, and mutual aid, uh, very much was associated with abstinence and then has evolved over the years in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, stakeholders started to think a bit more broadly in terms of not just about abstinence, but about sustained control over substance use um, and ensuring that it was about people's well-being and health. Uh, and also giving them the opportunity to participate in the rights and roles of uh, society and the responsibilities of society. And then what happened was, and I think quite rightly so, some critical um, policy scholars took issue with that and pointed out that actually this was um, quite a, a, a dangerous route to go down because effectively, if we were talking about recovery in these terms, we were basically pushing back onto people responsibility for recovery. 
And that's despite the fact that we all know that uh, substance use disorders often occur in a context where there are structural problems, you know, housing, homelessness, legal issues, political issues that mean it can be quite hard for someone just to overcome their substance use. So there's a danger that the recovery agenda was sidestepping that. And a not dissimilar issue has occurred in relation to person-centred care. I think it would be fair to say that most of us on the call probably think there's nothing um, wrong and everything to be gained from encouraging people to participate in their own treatment and for us to make sure that uh, treatment offers people choice and is person-centred. But of course, we can level some of the same criticisms at this concept because, in fact, um, any treatment provision has to occur within a, a bureaucratic framework, within a legal framework. Somebody can't just simply go to a treatment service and choose their substance. Treatment providers have to abide by regulations. And it might also be the case that people who are um, making choices about their own treatment aren't well informed or don't have access to information or probably simply don't want to make that choice at the moment. So we have these kind of guiding concepts in our policy in the UK. Um, both are complex, both are contested, and both have really been criticised for promoting neoliberal notions of individualism and expecting people to take care of themselves and often failing to recognise the structural issues that affect people's lives. So that's the backdrop. I just want to put that to one side for a minute and now move to the empirical data. So I mentioned it was a, a qualitative study. It's actually a qualitative longitudinal study. And what we've done is recruited people from six community-based treatment services in England and Wales. The recruitment happened um, between 2021, 2022. And just so you understand, that was at the point where um, long-acting injectable buprenorphine was being introduced into the UK. So it was very much a new treatment, not widely available. It was just seeping into the system. So that meant all of our participants, and there were 26 of them, had uh, initiated late for the first time. And once we'd interviewed them uh, for the first time, we collected data at another four time points. So, uh, well, actually five points in total. So we interviewed them within 72 hours, starting treatment after a week, after a month, after three months, and after six months. So you've got time one, time two, time three, time four, time five. We conducted uh, telephone interviews. The data collection started during COVID. So all of the interviews and follow-ups were done by telephone. They were all audio recorded. They were all uh, transcribed. So we recruited 26 people and uh, we got 24 of the next wave, 20, 20, 17. So out of a possible 130 interviews at the five time points, we had 107 completed. So what did we ask them? We had uh, topic guides. The first topic guide asked people about their background, about their substance use, any previous treatment experiences, about their decision to have Buvidol, about what it was like when they had the first injection, how they felt since, how satisfied they were, and then what they expected of the treatment going forward. And the following uh, interviews followed a similar structured topic guide um, that was very similar so we could compare across time points and in the second third fourth fifth time points we were interviewing people and asking them about treatment changes between the current interview and the previous interview so what's it been like for example between the last 72 hour between the first 72 hour interview and the one week interview and then again what's it been like between the one week interview and the three months interview etc we also asked them about how they felt about having another injection, how they'd made the decision or decided not to have it, and again, what they thought um, the treatment was going to be like going forwards. So 26 people, probably nothing terribly unusual about this group of people for a treatment population in the UK. They were mostly male, um, 18 were male, had a range of ages from 30 to 62, mostly white British, 24 of the 26 were being treated for heroin. Uh, one was being treated for codeine and tramadol and one for methadone. And they got a range of uh, heroin experience, 
and um, a range of other problems. So there was obviously, as you might expect, some physical health problems, mental health problems. People were generally out of work. Now, if you're, if you're not qualitative and you're not interested, feel free to check your emails for a couple of minutes. But I think as a, as a qualitative researcher, I probably won't be forgiven if I don't just spend two minutes talking about how we analyze the data. Because as I said, there's quite a lot of interview waves, so it's quite unusual. And um, we basically used um, a software package, MatchQDA, to code the data line by line. And we had similar coding frames for each of the five waves of interviews. And as part of that process, all data relating to patients' goals were coded to one um, code that was called goals. And then we exported that to a Word document. I then had a, uh, an Excel file and each row of the Excel file represented one person. Each column represented one of the five time points. So there were 26 rows, five columns. And we um, well, then I populated the Excel file with information on people's goals for their treatment at the relevant time point. Then created a six column and looked across each participant and basically summarized their, their goals journey, if you like, what they hoped across the time frame of the interviewing period, so that all of that data was summarized in a six column and then looked down the column to look for themes and patterns. Put that information into a Word document looked to how we could um, identify main and subheadings. That had been a quite a reductive process. So having gone from uh, interview transcripts with verbatim to basically um, data in a spreadsheet to headings and bullet points, we then went back through the data to supplement that data, to check the data and to find uh, relevant quotations. So if you're uh, quantitative, you can look back now. I'm going to talk about the findings. And the findings, I've structured them under um, goal type, goals over time, and goal mediators and moderators. And what I'll do is I'll just spend a couple of minutes on each of those three. And there are um, three, three items under goal type, three under goals over time, and then a couple under mediators and moderators. So what did they say their goals were in terms of their substance use? So it was interesting to hear that many participants said they wanted to be drug free or abstinent or they used the word clean, but they didn't actually really define what they meant by this. So they weren't clear on whether they wanted to actually come off just heroin or come off all illicit substances or whether they wanted to come off their medication as well. It was all a bit vague. What was clear that there was only one participant at time one who said he wanted to complete using to continue using heroin. And basically he said he wanted to continue using heroin, but it was ruining his life. So he felt he had no option but to try the medication. Um, unfortunately, we lost him after the first interview. He was one of the few that we didn't manage to follow up after time one. So we can probably guess um, what might have happened. So some said they wanted to be abstinent from both illicit substances and prescribed medications. Uh, some said they wanted to be on the medication for the foreseeable future. And some were uncertain about whether they will continue to use other drugs. Particularly, they weren't sure what they were going to do about their crack cocaine use or their alcohol use or the cannabis use. And some said they would address this later once they'd addressed their heroin use. So participant 14 said, like baby steps, first adjusting to life heroin free, ultimately down the line, I'll address my crack issue. I would like to address it. So I'm actually, I mean, I'm going to be rattling through some of these headings and it may start to blur, but rest assured, I will have a summary slide at the end just to summarize everything. In terms of the goal type for their treatment for their long acting injectable buprenorphine, very few participants wanted to be maintained on it indefinitely, which is quite interesting as it is a medication for uh, maintenance. Most said that they wanted to come off at some point but again, they were quite vague about when they wanted to come off. So most said oh, maybe a couple of months or up to a couple of years. But the key point was they really didn't want to rush. There were only two of the 26 who said they wanted to come off quickly. And actually, by time point four, one of them had totally changed their mind and said they wanted to take it slowly. And the other one had actually been taken off the medication because he hadn't uh, attended for another injection. Um. 
some didn't want to think about the future of their treatment or were just happy to think um, that let their doctors make decisions for them. And again, I think that speaks to the personalization issue where we can give people choice, but some people really just would rather let doctors choose for them. So participant 17 said, I'm not sure how long the plans are, but knowing the drug service, they'll keep me on Bouvidol for as long as I need to be. So this participant had complete faith in his provider. And it gets interesting because they almost all wanted to achieve life goals relating to their relationships, particularly relationships with family members and friends, especially children. Um, they were interested in having goals around education, training, voluntary work, employment, housing, health, sorting out, um, going to the gym, uh, sorting out their teeth, uh, learning how to cook, paying bills. Now, what's interesting for anybody who's obviously familiar with the concept of recovery, these are all kind of goals that people tend to associate with recovery. So they were identifying what we might think are recovery related goals, but they weren't using the term recovery. In fact, I think only two use the term recovery. I think three indirectly refer to themselves as being in recovery and a couple said they wanted to be recovery workers. So as Participant 26 said, I do want to get into either work or a course or university or something, but when my mental health's a little bit better. So they had clear life goals, but didn't really talk about them in terms of recovery. When we looked at whether or not the goals changed over time, it was interesting that they were remarkably uh, consistent. So sometimes people say virtually the same thing at each time point. So we can see this here with participant 23, at time, point 23, at time point three, she says, I'm at college. I do want to become like a support worker, a mental health worker, whether it be drug related or not. At time point four, she says, I'm hoping to become a mental health support worker. I've enrolled into a couple of short courses and I've also got an appointment with a careers advisor to give me a bit of direction. She said very similar things at her other interviews as well. So there was quite um, good goal consistency here. Having said that, some people's goals did evolve over time. So sometimes people started with try, quite modest treatment goals, just stabilizing, and they, they developed more sort of ambitious treatment reduction plans at later interviews. So participant 19 said, I wanted to give a negative urine sample. That's what he said at, at time one. By time three, he was talking about reducing once he was stable. And by time five, he had more concrete plans for reducing and coming off all medication. Having said that, um, some participants said they wanted to come off medication in the next couple of months, you know, sometime soon, not rush, but in a, maybe in a couple of months. But what was interesting, we found that as the study progressed, they kind of kicked those goals into the long grass a little bit. So the goals remained the same. They still wanted to come off. That each time we got to the next interview, they, they pushed that goal of coming off a little bit further back. And participant 15 was uh, an obvious example of this. He said that he wanted to cease his treatment within three months of time one, but extended this each interview. And by time five, he wanted to be on the treatment for another five months. Then, of course, there were a few participants who um, had been taken off the medication. There are actually four who come off and had stopped receiving, and this had obviously disrupted their treatment goals. So one had come off because she hadn't felt uh, comfortable on the medication. In fact, she said she'd been uncomfortable from the very first uh, week of treatment. And then three had been taken off the medication by their providers. Two had not attended um, for their follow-up injections, and one had actually given a positive urine test, and he'd been taken off the medication. Now, what was interesting was those three participants who'd been taken off were really unhappy. They were very frustrated and they felt very, very unsupported. So this is participant 25 and she says, I'm no longer on the Bouvidol. I had an appointment that week. I thought I was going back on the injection, but no, they still haven't put me on it yet. I don't feel like I'm being listened to there or supported. Okay, moving on to the third um, category of findings, if you like, goal mediators and moderators. So participants were really clear on what was stopping them from achieving their goals. They had really good insights into this. They talked about their own personal poor health. They talked about it being difficult for them whilst they had mental health problems. 
or it was difficult for them whilst they were experiencing pain. They said it was difficult when they were getting no support from treatment services. So they hadn't been attending services because obviously um, they were having the depot injection, but they were finding it very difficult to get services to contact them or to stay in touch with them. There were no groups, there, were no, there was no individual counselling, um, there was no psychosocial support, and there was no wraparound support to help them with the broader factors that were affecting their goals, the homelessness, um, not having a routine, not having a job. Nobody was giving them any support with that. And they complained about that. They said that that lack of support was undermining their ability to work towards their goals. And some of them felt really let down by providers, uh, not just by the fact that they didn't contact them and it was difficult to make contact with them, but because this available wraparound support that they wanted and were hoping to get wasn't, wasn't there. This is participant 19. I feel so let down by it. That's the treatment service. And if I didn't have the support network, this participant had a very supportive uh, partner and family. I don't know where I'd be. Conversely, um, again, they were very insightful into factors that helped them achieve their goals. They recognised that supportive family members and uh, partners were really helpful. Having interests and hobbies that occupied them was really important. For some, going to mutual aid meetings and sharing their experiences was important. And for some, having paid work, having money, not just uh, activity, but having money where they could buy things and they could even buy food, things that they needed to help them achieve their goals. And many recognised that medication was helping them to achieve their goals. And some explained how the medication had acted in a sort of catalytic way to help them achieve other positive life changes. So this, this participant, participant 11, he was on the treatment with uh, his brother. And he pointed out that the Bubidol had boosted his mood. And then he went on to say that I've got money in my pocket all the time. That's because he wasn't um, buying heroin anymore. And that's unheard of. Sometimes I go three, four days without eating food. No food in the cupboard. Now we've got food in the cupboard, food in the fridge, food in the freezer. Obviously, because I'm eating, I wake up, I feel great. I have breakfast. I never used to have breakfast. Now the next step is to get back into work. So you can see how things were kind of escalating in a positive way for him. Oh, sorry, I think I might have skipped. Yeah, yeah. Back to the uh, summary. So just to summarise what I've I've said, just so we're all um, clear. So participants often said they wanted to be abstinent or drug free, but they didn't clarify what they meant by that. And um, they very seldom used the word recovery, but actually the goals that they articulated were consistent with recovery as it's often reported in the literature. The goals tended to be consistent over time, but sometimes they evolved a little bit. And sometimes um, they extended the time frame for beginning to reduce the injectable treatment. As time progressed, they pushed that back a little bit uh, further into the future. Generally, they had good insights and recognized that achieving their goals was going to take time because they understood that they had other quite complex issues going on in their lives. And they were really insightful into the types of resources they needed to achieve their treatment goals. And they were frustrated when services and systems failed to support them. Now, obviously, um, I'm talking about a study that was conducted in the UK, and it was conducted a couple of years ago. Difficult to uh, generalise to the situation here in Australia. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, the data were collected when LABE was new and that means that what people said and what I'm reporting may differ from other contexts and other settings. I just want to flag also that we didn't ask participants to distinguish between hopes, expectations, goals and plans. We'd used a very general term. And I think that may explain some of the findings, because if you think about somebody's hopes, that's kind of preference based. What somebody hopes is different from their expectation, which is more probability based. So you can actually, when you think about it, think about why somebody would say they hope to be um, off their medication, but then actually as that time frame approaches, they still hope to be off that medication, but they expect to be off it. Um, they're less likely to expect to be off it. So I think that may have been playing out in the data a little bit. So it's a bit of a limitation. And we didn't specifically ask them recovery about recovery. We didn't specifically ask them about recovery care. Um, about person-centred care because we just wanted to hear genuinely what they thought their goals were. 
And of course, we haven't presented data on whether participants achieved their goals, um, but we do have a one year follow up, which will enable us to look at that in due course. So I think there are some probably quite bland implications for practice. So I hope you're not going to slate me for saying what is probably the obvious. Um, but I do think it means the fact that people hadn't really thought about the goals and research hasn't really discussed it before. I think we do need to think more about what people's goals are and be asking them. Um, we also need to recognise that their goals may change over time. So it's, I think it's important for, for, for patients and providers just to think about all of the goals that lung acting injectable buprenorphine can potentially offer people. So it may not just be about their substance use. It may not just be in terms of coming off their medication, but what their longer life term goals are, because these are what's going through people's mind at the point where they're starting the treatment. As I say, these goals may change over time, but it may also help to highlight that people do need broader supportive systems and structures. It's not enough just to give somebody a medication and you know assume that they're going to achieve their goals. If we want people to uh, achieve their goals, change their behaviours, we have to think about those structural factors that people uh, might need structural forms of support and work with patients holistically and flexibly to involve them in their treatment decision making. And I want to just end on something that's possibly a little bit more controversial or probably worthy of debate. Again, I just want to point out that contrary to what I said at the beginning about um, the critiques of the concept of recovery and about person-centred care responsibilising people, there is no sense in this data set of whatsoever of patients feeling responsible that they hadn't achieved their goals quickly. When they didn't achieve their goals, they did a couple of things. They delayed their plans, so they were pragmatic about that. And they identified additional systems that would help them. They knew what they needed. And critically, they were really frustrated with services and cross at services for failing them. So I think that begs a slightly more controversial and debatable point. If we go back to the concepts of recovery in person-centered care, some people have said these are quite harmful and unhelpful concepts. I want to raise the issue that maybe policies relating to recovery and person-centered care, at least in the UK concept, are actually empowering patients to expect and actually realise that they're deserving of a greater range of support. Now, if the debates that we've had around recovery and person-centred care are actually raising people's expectations, um, then maybe the recovery debate has got another lap yet to run and we'll see more papers coming out. Happy to take uh, questions and discussions and uh, here's some references. And I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. Oh, thanks, Joe. Wow, that was fantastic. I've got a whole page worth of notes here. <laughs> Thank you again. That was really great. It's always lovely to hear you present. And I'm a qual person, so I love to hear um, the background and the, the proper detail for how the research is done, the methods. Um, if anyone online is not aware, I'd point you to some of Joe's published work around qual methods because they're beautifully described and make it a, a doable thing for people who don't have loads of experience with qual work. Um, so I'd now like to invite our panellists and Simon and Alison to turn their cameras on. Hello, welcome. So I might just start, I've got some, some thoughts here, but perhaps I'll hand to you first. Did, did either of you want to make any reflections or any initial comments or perhaps respond to that last point that Joe's raised around the recovery and the person-centred care uh, before we head out for questions to the audience? Maybe I'll start with um, Simon. Over to you, Simon. Um. Yeah, I what a wonderful presentation. Um, so many fantastic insights. Um, and I guess some of my own reflections is in my own work, I there's a lot of stuff that dovetails with it nicely, um, particularly around how people feel while they're on it, the way that they negotiate the treatment. Um, and something that was a big theme in my own work was people's relationship with support systems um, and points of tension there. And you do discuss that a little bit. So I was wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit, like how did your participants manage the lack of support um, when that um, came up? Yeah, I mean, maybe first a, a, just a further comment on the context in the UK that people may or may not be aware of, which is obviously our addiction treatment services have been quite seriously um, 
run down in recent years as in as in under resourced so there is a lack of support available for people and i think people uh, know that it was difficult to get beyond the fact that people were just quite cross that services weren't supporting them and they were phoning up i mean it, it's strange to think that sometimes um arguments are made that we need to get people into treatment and here we had in this data set and i've actually had it in other data sets currently as well We've got um, patients phoning services constantly trying to get in touch with people and nobody responding their call. And I don't think that's because the services are willfully um, poor. Uh, it's just there isn't the resource there for them uh, at, at the moment. Mm. So if the, if the resource isn't there, if they're fortunate enough and they've got family members or you know other people around who can help, then obviously they become um, alternative points of uh, support. Um, but of course, for some people, that those systems just aren't there, and that's where you know if somebody does come off medication, um, I, I don't know what would happen to them. Um, I don't mm. know what would happen to them. We are having an investment in services, fortunately, currently. So I'm I'm rather hoping that you know that over time this is going to improve going forwards a little bit, and we've been in a little bit of a low point. Mm. Uh, but for for people, I think at the until very recently, at least, it's it's really difficult if they need that additional support. Mm. Yeah, um, great. Oh, sorry, Simon. Keep going. No, I was just going to say, um, Alison, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on, on everything. Um, thank you, Joe, for a really um, broad-ranging presentation, really nice um, articulation of the consumer voice. Uh, so what you talked about we often see play out in the clinic in real life which is you know um, what you found I really resonate with and it's interesting what you're just talking about with the resourcing so we've just got a huge injection of funds for resourcing in our state but then we have a critical shortage of nursing and medical staff to be able to deliver that and um, and thus to get everybody on and not keep people waiting um, to get on program, it then becomes, you, you become a bit more of a sausage factory and you're less able to provide that wraparound support because you just want to get people into treatment um, to prevent those bad outcomes that happen if they have to wait. Yeah, if I, if I could just reinforce again, I'm not in any way being critical of people working in the treatment sector in the UK. I, I'm, it, it is a situational factor. It's not the lack of uh, commitment to the field. I just want to make that absolutely clear. Thanks, Joe. I might just um, jump in because we've just had a question lead leading on from that. Um, one of our uh, questions here is around just sort of diving in a bit more to the situation in the UK, politically regarding the supports and services. Um, you mentioned that there's been recent investment. Uh, why do you think this is? And is there any lessons that you would see as being relevant for Australia from the UK experience? Um, yeah, just oh, to kind of expand on that a bit. Big I question. Think, I don't think I would offer any <laughs> advice from the UK to Australia. Um, <laughs> we, what we've had is uh, we had the Dame Carol Black Review sort of 2019-20, uh, um, and that was a, a, a really important piece of work where there was a lot of consultation with consumers and providers, and it pointed out, you know, so many issues with the system, and we were just in a fortunate space where the government listened particularly to that to that review and so more funding has come on stream in, including some additional funding for research as well so that's still playing itself out as, as everybody knows when you get funding come on stream if it's not uh, committed for a very long time it can be quite difficult for services that have actually had no resources to then initiate new treatment forms because it takes a while to train people up to get people back into the system and then of course um if the if the money's only guaranteed for a year or two years, it, it, it's quite difficult. So we're in that stage at, at, at the moment. So uh, no, I wouldn't feel able to offer any advice, to be honest. And and of course, I'm not a clinician. So uh, just to be clear, I am a an academic researcher, not a clinician. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I think that's really useful. Um, yeah, I mean, this short term funding thing is something we hear all the time um, around this type of work, work with communities, um, it's a real issue. But, yeah, that's great. That's great context. Thanks, Joe. Um, the next question I'm just going to come to is from Nicola Jones. So it says, great presentation, Joe. What are your thoughts on tackling other substance use while initiating treatment for opioid use? 
was there a theme that other substance use was having a negative effect on Bouvidol treatment? So you, you mentioned um, you mentioned it briefly, but did you just want to expand on that? Yeah, I can say a little bit about that because my colleague Steve Parkin um, first offered a, another paper, which is on the reference list, which is about um, non-prescribed use, focusing on the first month of treatment. So he had a really deep look in the data at what substances people were using at the time in that first month. Um, and uh, as I can remember, as best as I can remember, um, there were some people using heroin, but it was somewhat episodic rather than uh, consistent. And they used heroin occasionally uh, because they were feeling withdrawal symptoms or they felt they were feeling withdrawal symptoms uh, because they felt pain. Um, and on one case, I think, to test the blockade effect, it was a definite test. Um, there were others who were um, definitely using crack cocaine and it had an effect on their crack cocaine use. Um, they'd been using heroin to basically level off after the crack cocaine. So once they didn't get that effect because they weren't using heroin, they started to look around for other things, maybe alcohol, benzos, to try and help with that. Crack cocaine was definitely an issue amongst the, the group that we spoke to. Um, and there was cannabis use ongoing that people uh, continued to use in the same ways they'd used before. So just to put it, and again, I don't want to quote numbers because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not representing anything in a sort of quantitative sense. But I think during that first month, I think of the 26 people, 17 had used some non-prescribed substance. But just to be clear, it wasn't consistent. It was quite a lot of episodic use over that month. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, Alison, did you have any anything to add to that or any thoughts from that from the kind of clinical perspective about um, sort of su substance use of using multiple substances at the same time um, in your experience? Um, I suppose it depends on the reasons why they've commenced on the depot preparation. So there's quite a disparate clinical population. So some patients are coming to us with quite chaotic use and it's considered safer. Um, so that often would be multi-substance use there perhaps. And then we've got our other um, population of people who may have been on OTP programs for a really long time who want the added you know what's perceived as added freedoms um, and so have changed over to depot and they're much less likely to have you know significant ongoing concerns with other substances yeah interesting um okay so i might just see simon did you have any other questions or any other thoughts that you wanted to add i know you had some burning questions up your sleeve i did <laughs> i do um you do touch on this. Well, you did touch on this, but I was wondering if you could expand on this a little bit more um, around the issue or experiences of side effects, um, because it's something that is in a lot of research has been mentioned um, and is kind of this issue that lurks in the background um, that seems to have a very diverse impact on people. Um, and some people struggle with it more than others. I've certainly found that in my work that some people will have quite a strong reaction initially and then work through it whilst others will have more chronic experiences of the side effects that are minor but more ongoing. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to that from your own research, like was side effects a major thing um, or was it a, a minor theme that people just kind of dealt with? So it's interesting if we think about what we mean exactly by side effects. So maybe I can uh, answer the question with reference to uh, another paper that we wrote, looking at people's experiences in the first 72 hours. So how they felt after the first 72 hours because I think it illustrates some of that complexity about what we mean by side effects. So during that first 72 hours, uh, people had negative and positive uh, experiences. And they had negative and positive physical experiences and negative and positive uh, cognitive or you know emotional experiences as well. So I suppose when we think about side effects, we think about withdrawal symptoms. And yes, quite a lot people reported withdrawal symptoms, but there was also a lot of confusion about what a withdrawal symptom was. So 
again, you know, people not knowing that is this is this a withdrawal symptom or is this COVID coming on or have I got a cold or I'm a bit achy, but I've got rheumatism. So maybe it's that. So there was people not really knowing what was a side effect of the medication. So they would they would talk about withdrawal, but not really appreciate if that was a side effect. They also talked about things like um, sleep problems, uh, constipation, uh, feeling a bit depressed, feeling isolated, feeling lonely. Um, but what was, as I say, what was also interesting was that there were many positive kind of side effects that you wouldn't expect. I suppose it depends on your definition of side effects. So in that 72 hours, what we were really surprised is that there were many people just saying, I feel fabulous. And, you know, like people said, my skin looks better already. And, oh, I've had such a, I've woken up bang on seven o'clock every morning, you know. So there were kind of unexpected things that you wouldn't expect to see which I suppose mm. technically could be side effects if we take that definition. Normally, just, we just think side effects negative. Um, and I think that the argument made that we make in the paper is that when people start a new medication, we tend to think of negative side effects, but we don't really tend to look at what those positive benefits may be. Now, maybe it may be because we have never looked at them, or maybe it's because long-acting injectable buprenorphine is quite unique in this respect in that it is able to produce quite quick um, responses in people um, that, that actually can make them feel physically and psychologically better quite quickly. To add to that, it wasn't consistent. So there's a lot of variability as well within the participant group and also people feeling great, you know, at 12 hours and then feeling worse at 24 hours. So it was quite an up and down period. But I do think that the side effects issue probably needs quite a lot of unpacking. If that was our data at 72 hours. Uh, I don't know quite what we'll find it when we look at it across the whole one year. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly found that a lot of my participants did a almost like a cost benefit analysis. Like these are the positive experiences that I've had and it's made me feel really good in these ways, but I've also had these more negative ones. Um, and so working out at what point is it worthwhile pursuing worthwhile pushing through and at what point is it easier to just get off and try something new um but yeah i i think the whole thing about side effects is really fascinating um and you're right like i think we do need to think about what does it actually mean to have a side effect I think there's also a little bit of confusion and I don't fully understand it. And there's maybe somebody um, uh, like Alison or somebody else who's clinical on the call who can address this. But my understanding, my very lay understanding as a as a sort of social policy person is that um, if you uh, feel that you're experiencing withdrawal symptoms, that may be because you don't have enough of the dose. On the other hand, if you've been taking a, an opioid where you've got... Um, you know, you've got full agonists in your system and you're taking buprenorphine, you may also experience withdrawal symptoms. So actually you could be underdosed or overdosed and have the same effects. I, I don't know if anybody can, I don't know if you can answer that question or elaborate a bit. Well, we, we certainly try very hard not to give you a precipitated withdrawal um, because I haven't seen it, but I've heard it's really horrible, really horrible. Uh, so yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Is I think the other thing that I just want to add from the clinical point of view is, you, Simon, you just touched on it, is people who are swapping over from other preparations, it's a huge amount of fear. You can imagine, like, it's just taking a dive into the unknown. So people really, really have to think very carefully about it and they do worry a lot about it. Um, so that is very apparent when you start people um, very apprehensive. And the other thing is when they get the injection, it really <laughs> hurts. Um, so that's a side effect we often hear about from people. And that is a, that is a drawback, but most people, you know, I'm making a generalization here. Often we find that once they have made that leap, that, um, many people are, are just find it, you know, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm so happy I did this, you know, there's no turning back now sort of thing. Um, but, Sometimes, as you have found, Simon, in your research, that's not the case if people feel that 
you know, the, this was the only option presented to them or they were sort of felt that their um, prescriber was forcing them to change from another preparation onto depot for whatever reason. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, it's really, it is an interesting thing, sort of this positive negative side effect um, thing is something I hadn't thought about. Um, the other thing I thought was really interesting, Joe, was around the goals and the types of goals that people selected and what, what that looked like. We've been doing some work here um, with the treatment service in Sydney around goals and, and looking at some of this as well. So it's an area that, that I have interest in. It's also been brought up on the chat by um, one of the question by a question as well. So I'm just going to have a go at this question. Um, so they've said, thank you very much, Joe. Very interesting. And it resonates a lot with my experience of providing OAT. So they're wondering about this idea about goals as well and saying, you know, for instance, in their experience, sometimes people want to reduce their opioid use, but they enjoy use and so want to use it, say, occasionally, maybe once a fortnight. Um, but, you know, wondering, you know, is there space to have these discussions in a supportive way with clinicians about this, you know, wanting to keep using it occasionally as a, uh, as a choice um, type of issue? And if you know how they navigate those discussions with healthcare providers, so just wondering, did any of that come? Those sorts of ideas come up in your data um, or in any of your previous studies as well? And then maybe to Alison and Simon as well, if you had similar thoughts. I think that's a really interesting question, and it comes back a little bit to the context. And I think the context at the point where we were doing the um, study of recruiting is probably different from the context here now. So at the point when we were doing the recruiting. Um, there was not much definite. We only have one licensed product. So we only had the Bouvidar product. That's the only option. So there's the Bouvidar weekly or the Bouvidar monthly. And there wasn't much of it about. It certainly wasn't available in the prison at that point in time. And um, not all services were doing it and some were just piloting it. So I think that may have skewed people's um, approach to getting on the medication because they, uh, they were kind of one of the reasons that they wanted the medication was because it was being sold as something special and different and you had to be a bit unique to get onto it. And therefore there was an attraction, a pull to the medication, which again may have meant that those people who actually secured a place with the treatment were those who were actually very committed to coming off at some point and were, were, were very strongly um, committed to the medication. So I suppose thinking just guessing my assumption would be at the time there would be little discussion around uh those kinds of additional goals of perhaps using occasionally because the treatment was so limited that what services were saying is you have to be quite committed to want this treatment it's an expensive medication you have to be really committed and the patients were saying it's my last shot i want to come off everything so i think that may have skewed our sample a little bit and that mean it means the findings may not relate to the uh current Australian context. So I am interested to hear what Alison and Simon have to say. Um, it's really interesting hearing that because in my own work, it was very, very different. Um, people, a lot of participants had tried heroin to see whether or not it would take. Um, and often it was said with a tone of disappointment that it didn't work, it didn't do anything, and so they had wasted some money. Um, where there are other people who just tried to override the depot and just take huge hits. Um, but yeah, I remember having one participant who she had started depot but was really struggling to, she was taking um, painkillers and she was she kept taking them on top of the depot, even though I don't think they were having much of an effect, but it was more the habit of wanting to take something. Um, but certainly in the Australian context, depot was or is presented as this exciting new treatment, but it is nestled within a lot of other ones. And so there is still a lot more choice and access to other ones, whereas it sounds like in the UK, it's a bit more of a, a special thing um and it's the access is different um but i'm curious to see what you have to say on this alice um well i think the, the number one thing is to set the scene is is that consumers are often it's often 
it's often not their first time on program or they might have been on program for a long time and they're very wary of what they tell their prescriber in particular because they've been let down by the system often many, many times, not just in OTP, but in other areas of their life. So they're very, very wary about what they tell us. So obviously we tell our um, consumers that the, the, the program is around safety. Um, that, that's our goal for them and stability. Uh, it's not about judgment on what other substances they use, but um, you have to be quite brave, I think, uh, to to necessarily tell your prescriber in particular because you're concerned about, you know, what might happen as a result of that disclosure. So that's a very big thing in OTP. Oh, beautifully said. Beautifully said, Alison. Thank you. Um, we've just got one more question and about, you know, a minute to go. So I'm just going to quite quickly ask it if I can. Um, we've got a, a question here, um, Joe, for you around, did any anyone participating in the study have a planned reduction um, to come off Bubidol during the time period? And if so, could you just describe briefly what that experience was like? Yeah, so we had people working towards a planned reduction. We had one participant who did come off, um, who, who during the course of one year, we saw him actually reduce uh, plan to come off and come off and then there were others who at stages six months and 12 months were were on that trajectory but hadn't got there yet so again it, it's difficult when you're playing with numbers you know 26 is very small but one but but obviously if one person did it it does happen it does happen yeah excellent thank you um, okay, so we are just almost at four. So I am going to thank our wonderful pres presenter, Joe, and our fantastic panel for your insights and discussion today. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion and I've um, got lots of notes and um, things to think through. So thank you. Um, so this is our last session for the year. So we'll be seeing you again in February for our next webinar. Um, we thank you for all your support this year, for all of our presenters, all our panellists. It's been a really interesting year of webinar sessions. Um, we're well into planning for 2024. So we look forward to seeing you at the next, uh, the next webinar in early next year. And we just like to say, have a lovely break when we get there, nearly there, and we'll see you in 2024. Thanks, everyone.